There's a lot of mystery and unknowns when it comes to General George Washington's right-hand strongman. But what is known is that this incredible hulk of the American Revolution was quite the heroic soldier. His legendary feats earned him the nickname of Virginia Giant, Giant of the Revolution, and Virginia Hercules. His beginnings are not fully known, but it is believed that Francisco was born in Portugal on July 9, 1760, on the island of Tercera. His parents, Luis Francisco Mochado and Antonio Maria, were natives of mainland Portugal and were believed to be a noble and fairly wealthy family. The story goes that they settled on the island of Tercera to distance themselves from enemies on the continent. Legend has it that Francisco appeared on the docks at City Point, Virginia in 1765 alone. Locals tried to converse with the young boy who could only speak Portuguese and when spoken to kept repeating the name Pedro Francisco. He was taken off to Prince George County Poorhouse where he came to the attention of Anthony Winston, a local judge and uncle to the one and only Patrick Henry. Winston took the boy in taught him English and cared for him. When he was finally able to communicate, he divulged that he had lived in a mansion near the ocean, that his mother spoke French and his father spoke a language he did not know. He said that he and his sister were kidnapped from their home, but that his sister had escaped while he was carted off to a ship. Why he was kidnapped, historians have never been able to find out. Some theories say that they intended to sell him as an indentured servant. Only who would abandon the boy in such case? Others have offered that Pedro's abduction was an elaborate scheme cooked up by his parents to protect him from political enemies of his family. Whatever the case, he remained in the home of Judge Winston, working on his farm. As he got older, he continued to grow, and grow, and grow, and by his early teens was nearly a foot taller than the average man. He learned the trade of blacksmithing, which was a good fit for him, someone of his size and strength. Peter would eventually reach 6 foot 6 inches and 260 pounds. Peter accompanied Judge Winston to Richmond in March of 1774 to a meeting of the Virginia Convention. As you can imagine, at this time, just before the revolution began, tempers and emotions were at an all-time high. He listened intently as Virginians debated and aired the grievances against Great Britain and King George. Later that day, in a tavern, Peter became part of that action when he played bouncer between two disputing customers. He broke up their scuffle by lifting each one of them into the air and banging them together until they stopped arguing. It was also during this convention that he would have heard the historic words of Patrick Henry as he stood outside of St. John's Church and declared, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And at the age of 16, Judge Winston finally gave in to Peter's pleas and allowed him to enlist with the 10th Virginia Regiment as a private. His first battle was at Brandywine Creek in September of 1777, where General George Washington was trying to stop the advancement of 12,500 British troops. Washington's army was badly defeated and made a disorderly retreat, but the regiment that Peter was a member of held the line at Sandy Hollow Gap for 45 minutes and allowed the rest of the men to withdraw and consequently saved many lives. He suffered a gunshot wound to his legs for his efforts, and while healing up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, he and the also injured Major General the Marquis de Lafayette reportedly met and became friends. But by October he had healed and was eager to rejoin his regiment, just in time for the Battle of Germantown. For the next three years, he followed General Washington, performing tasks of extraordinary feats and courage. At the Battle of Camden, one of the worst defeats the Americans suffered, Francisco's legend was truly born. As the Americans were surrounded by the British, Peter speared a British cavalryman with his bayonet and simultaneously hoisted him from his horse. He then climbed on top of the horse and escaped through the enemy line by pretending he was a Tory sympathizer. When he caught up to his men, he gave the horse to his colonel and saved the officer's life. But if that wasn't enough, seeing two American cannons there about to be left behind for the British, legend has it that Peter lifted the 1,100-pound gun from its carriage, threw it up on his shoulder, and carried it off the battlefield. At Guilford Courthouse, Peter gave another strongman show when he cut down 11 British soldiers in succession with a broadsword. 
One guard pinned his leg to his horse with a bayonet. Peter assisted the assailant to draw his bayonet, and when he did, Peter swung his sword and cleft the poor fellow's head to his shoulders, according to Benson Lossing, who later recounted the tale. Even though he was wounded, Peter did not leave the battlefield, and in one more attack on the British, he killed two more men before receiving a bayonet wound in his right thigh, which entered above his knee and came out the socket of his hip. Having suffered five different wounds in service to his country and the cause of freedom, Peter went home to Virginia. But this remarkable man didn't go home to retire. He volunteered as a scout to monitor Bannister Tarleton's operations in Virginia. While out on a mission, Peter stopped at the inn of Ben Ward, where nine of Tarleton's soldiers surrounded him and announced that he was under arrest and to hand over his silver shoe buckles. Not a soldier who was ever prone for surrendering, Peter sneered to the men to take them yourself. As the British soldier bent over to do just that, Peter grabbed the man's saber and struck him on the head. The wounded man fired a pistol at Peter that grazed his side, his sixth wound of the war. And Peter struck at the man and nearly cut off his hand. Another British soldier attempted to fire at him with a musket, but luckily it misfired and Peter grabbed it from his hand and knocked the soldier off his horse, which Peter quickly mounted and made an escape. With this little confrontation, Peter ended his military service, but he was granted the honor of being present at the surrender of General Cornwallis at Yorktown in October of 1781. After the war, Peter pursued his education going to school with children who were reportedly awed by his tales of the war and his enormous size as he sat in the school desk next to them. In December of 1784, he became part of the landed gentry when he married Susanna Anderson, and they had two children before she passed away in 1790. He married again in 1794 to Catherine Brooke, with whom he had three sons and one daughter. Catherine passed away in 1821 and he remarried for a third time to the widow Mary Grimes West. Peter was happy to recount all his war tales to anyone who cared to listen. He served as the Sergeant at Arms for the Virginia State Senate, and he died in January 1831 at the age of 71 from an apparent appendicitis. He was buried with full military honors in Richmond's Shaco Hill Cemetery in the presence of many dignitaries. On a memorial in the town square of New Bedford, Massachusetts, George Washington's words about him can be found. Without him, we would have lost two crucial battles, perhaps the war, and with it our freedom. He was truly a one-man army. Four states have proclaimed March 15th as Peter Francisco Day. He was honored with a commemorative post stamp and several monuments stand at in his honor. Peter Francisco is how history happens. If you're interested in seeing current strongmen recreate Peter's amazing feats, check out the video from the History Channel series, Strongest Man in History. And if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Thanks for your support.